Okay. So <clears throat> the industry, what investors didn't understand about the industry was how fractured it really is. And from people from the outside that haven't worked in it, they don't understand that these markets are very small. California isn't even a unified market. There's a Northern California market and there's a Southern California market. I mean, try to get a delivery truck between the two. You're spe you can't do it because the regulations make you change drivers and, and yada, yada, yada. So you have a lot, of, um, a lot of barriers. This fractured nature makes it really hard for investors to put money in and get it out in a predictable way. That's compounded by the federal regulations. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, my two colleagues, Dan Weiss and Nathaniel Leach. And we have two guests today. We have Echo Roofer as well as Josh Hoffman. Uh, we really appreciate the two of you joining us today. Our podcast for today, I actually really, really like Dan's uh, title, The Plant That Keeps Giving. The question is, what plant is it? Yes, it is cannabis or marijuana, whichever one you'd like to choose. We have two experts in the field that we're so excited to talk about. As Echo is just saying, she is the toxicologist. We have Josh on the business side. We have the science and the art, and we're going to mash them together and have a great conversation. Uh, before we jump into it, I would like to read some bios on both Josh and Echo. But before I get there, if you enjoy this episode, please, please, please share, like, and subscribe to our podcast channels. Our channels go across the Spotify uh, podcast network. We have Apple Podcasts, we're on Buzzsprout, we're on a bunch of different um, channels, YouTube. So if you do enjoy this, it would be really helpful if you would just please like, share, and subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. So to get us started, I'm gonna read off a bio so our listeners can get up to speed on who we're speaking with. I'm gonna start with Echo. Uh, so we have Echo Roofer. She has a PhD and is also DABT, which for people who do not know, which I had to look up, that is for the Board of Toxicology. It is a, de a certified designation. So Echo is the head of biocompatibility and toxicology at PAX Labs. In her role at PAX, Echo ensures the safety of PAX products by guiding safer material choices, conducting toxicological assessments, and shaping industry standards and consumer safety. Previously, Echo worked for the principal, uh, as the principal toxicologist at Apple and senior toxicologist at P&G. Uh, Echo received her bachelor's in science from pharmacology and toxicology and her PhD in molecular and environmental toxicology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Very awesome bio. Wonderful to have you here, Echo. Um, our second guest, Josh. So we have Josh Hoffman is a cradle to grave subject matter expert in the cannabis industry. Hoffman's diverse set of product development and supply chain optimization skills have set him apart as a vital resource in cannabis. He has been a part of exciting companies and products like PAX, Spark, Marky Natural, Legion of Boom, Do uh, Doset, Privateer, and Canna Craft. Hoffman holds a degree in political science from Warner Wilson and a master's in urban planning from the University of Florida. He lives in South Florida with his wife, son, dog, and his guitars. So thank you, Josh and Echo, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, to get us started with some questions, I'm going to kick this one off to Echo. But Josh, please join in after just to kind of give your two cents as well. But I am just curious, the cannabis and marijuana industry for us has actually been really silent in 2020. And it was really, actually 2020 and 2021. Cryptocurrency was the taker of those two years. But prior to that, in 2019, 2018, we could not have a conversation from an investment perspective without cannabis or marijuana coming up as a conversation. So I am just curious, Echo, could you tell us a little bit about where the industry is right now and uh, where it's potentially going? Yeah, so I think that the industry has come a long way, but it still has a long ways to go. You know, I'm looking at this, of course, from like a safety perspective, a regulatory perspective, you know, uh, 
I suppose in some cases, a product perspective. And I think, you know, the fact that it's legalized in many states as well as Canada and a few other countries is fantastic. But the federal illegality in the US is still a huge problem and it greatly stifles research. It leads to like non-standardized regulations around the country that are, you know, based on varying levels of expertise in those regulatory agencies. And so it's it's led to this mismatch of all sorts of, of stuff. And that, that makes it incredibly frustrating for me who tries to think about this from a, from a national perspective. And so that federal illegality is, is really problematic. But I do think that, you know, with the, the new administration and the greater public acceptance of, of cannabis, that it, we're moving in the right direction, even if it's slower than, than those of us in the industry and, and probably a number of consumers would like to see. So I think pro like Josh probably has some, some more insight as to where the industry is going per se. Cause I know he's got all sorts of creative ideas and thoughts all the time. <laughs> what do you got for us, Josh? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Okay. So <clears throat> the industry, what investors didn't understand about the industry was how fractured it really is. And from people from the outside that haven't worked in it, they don't understand that these markets are very small. California isn't even a unified market. There's a Northern California market and there's a Southern California market. I mean, try to get a delivery truck between the two. You're spent, you can't do it because the regulations make you change drivers and, and yada, yada, yada. So you have a lot, of, um, a lot of barriers. This fractured nature makes it really hard for investors to put money in and get it out in a predictable way. That's compounded by the federal regulations. So the industry was in this really hyper momentum space in 2019 and um, 2018, 2019, because investors didn't know they couldn't really put their money in and get it back in a predictable way. Everyone just saw this as being the next big industry. And they're right. It will be the next big industry. But most, most times we don't see emerging industries of this size anywhere. This is, this is a unique phenomenon. And because it's, it was illegal and it's then went a gray market and now in some places it's legal, that further adds to the fractured nature of the industry. On top of that, you really don't have leaders in categories or in brands or anything. The largest one is PAX. And you know, outside of the world of cannabis, people don't know about it. So it's um, the, the industry is a bit of has a bit of an echo chamber where we listen to our own things and believe it. And then when rubber meets the road, there isn't actually a runway to take off. It's, it, and so you've got these really, um, this kind of high churn. So all these founders and all these people have been in this for a long time, they're getting burnt out and they're, and they're feeling it because the regulations are big and um, there's a lot of challenges uh, ahead of them. And then on top of it, they've got competition from illegal markets. They have competition from new gray markets like Delta 8. And so, you know, and, and all the while they're having to give, you know, 35% of whatever they do to the government. So there isn't really an incentive of aligned interest between the government, the regulators, the regulated, and the consumers. And until those things are sorted out a bit, there's still going to be a lot of choppy waters ahead. The biggest thing that could happen would be the reclassification of cannabis which would keep it away from hard regulation from the federal government and allow there to be a bit more of this fracturedness, but the banking wouldn't be an issue. And when you get the banking locked in, it doesn't matter how legal, super legal, declassified legal, the second the banks can get involved in a, in a, reg, in a predictable way with the industry, you'll start to see that fractured nature start to, to, to kind of consolidate and come together. So what's in the future for the industry is the need to pass sound banking and kind of R&D regulations so that the industry can start to mature and legitimize itself in its own kind of practices. It's really interesting. And, and what's funny about the banking piece is we've run into that just within our own client base and just you know being participants within other aspects. And what's been fascinating is the acquisition of Canadian companies of American companies, and then the ability to try to get 
yeah, it to try to get their money out or get even access to shares just due to the federal regulations in the United States, which has been extremely an interesting process and becoming, at least I should, I should, I should give this some reference. That was back in 2019 when we ran into the issue of trying to get money across borders due to the federal regulations. And it was closing up fast. I mean, to the point where I could only find one broker in Canada that would actually do the deal and get it done at a reasonable price. And so it's a, that is a really important piece where what we're starting to see is, a, like you mentioned, a lot of investor money sitting here, but then how do you realize your gain or how do you realize or pay it back into cash and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's a really uh, a good point. I, I'm curious, Josh, like, could you tell us a little bit more how you got into this field and, and have gotten so deep into just different aspects of cannabis? And it sounds like more on the business operational side of things. Right. So um, I've been selling since I was 13, growing since I was 18. <laughs> um, started my first cannabis company in 2012 with my friends, sold my shares on that in around 2015, moved over to a vertically integrated company called Spark and helped them grow from one dispensary to about five and move from an indoor grow to outdoor grow with distribution. We created a few brands and did a bunch of product development in there. And along the way, I was a cons I consulted on behalf of Spark for companies like Pax uh, to help them at the beginning turn like the jewel into the into the era, um, as well as with Privateer to launch like Marley Natural and um, and helped even local companies like Legion of Bloom and um, and 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 the, and the likes uh, kind of understand what problems to solve in the industry and and what products would distinguish them. And so um, just kind of. It's, it's like been my life to do, to do this stuff. And I've, and I've very much gone from running a cannabis company, selling to a dispensary, getting picked from the dispens, getting pulled into the dispensary to run their product, doing a bunch of business development, meeting lots of people, and then getting opportunities from there to go to great companies like PAX. And now at Greenlane, heading up their uh, product development and innovation. Very cool. And what about you, Echo? How did you end up getting into the cannabis industry, being a toxicologist coming from Apple? Yeah, I'm, I am now toxicologist number three in the industry. Um, I will say one of them I hired and the other one I, I work uh, very closely with that started last fall. Um, but I got into PAC simply because I was kind of getting bored at Apple. I was looking at, you know, it started out really interesting and then it got to be a bit monot monotonous. I was working on their wearable programs and some other things, but like it got to be like every quarter, my job is to look at a new color watch band that's the exact same as last quarter, but it's like we're on blue number 52 instead of blue number 50. And it just was like the same old, same old. So I was, I was looking for something new. I wanted to move from San Francisco, from San Jose. And, you know, I, I saw this job at PAX online and kind of sent it to a friend of mine who happened to be a CEO of another cannabis company and said, ha ha, look at, I could work in your field, you know, like as a total joke. And he's like, wait a minute, Echo, you absolutely should get into it. This is a huge opportunity. We absolutely need you. And I'm like, I don't know. And then, you know, we, we got together and he absolutely convinced me and I applied. And then a month or two later, I was at PAX in cannabis as being like, you know, my, my, uh, a former colleague used to uh, say I'm a cannabis in or uh, the first in toxicologist as opposed to toxicologist because really, you know, PAX's job is to intoxicate people. <laughs> it's, it's surprising as I would think to other people listening that there are three people working in, you know, the in toxicology when it comes to this industry. Uh, not surprising that you're one of them. We've known you for a while. That doesn't surprise me at all. Um, but that there's only three. Why is that? Does does what Josh just said, the, the idea of the feds don't know what they're really dealing with, does does a toxicologist provide a better picture for them? Uh, and and, wh and what, what's going to, what's that landscape going to look like? I mean, do you expect to see a lot more of you? Yeah. Should there be? There, there absolutely should be. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of people that really care about the safety of cannabis products and are trying to do their best to make safe products. However, they're just 
not really formally trained. There are lots of engineers that I run into, a lot of chemists, a lot of, you know, business people even that think they know, and, and I mean, I think their heart in general is there in making safer products. However, you just don't know what you don't know. And so I'm, I'm speaking to more like classically trained toxicologists. There are people trying to fulfill that role, um, which is, is good. And it's, it's a first step, but I do see, you know, the future being that more people need to get involved. Um, because otherwise you run into these issues of these people who don't know, and they make restrictions that don't make sense. And then they miss other things because they, they just don't know. And so I do think people who, who have a, a good understanding of toxicology and risk and you know the products and how products are used can be very informative from a, a regulatory standpoint um, and helping them to understand really what makes sense and not lead to to, not to create problems. I mean, one thing that, you know, toxicologists in, in other fields, but I don't think cannabis necessarily thinks about this enough yet, is that, you know, what I think gov or regulatory bodies as well as consumers and, and the public want are safer products. And, you know, they have to think about it from a risk perspective in that, you know, and then also a, a risk versus benefit perspective, because you have a situation where, you know, the cat's kind of out of the bag. You're not going to, cannabis isn't going to go away. And so if you ban it, for example, or you ban certain additives or ingredients or something like that, what happens is you run people to the illicit market, which is a whole, is a free for all. And you can really run into some problems in that, on that side of things. So um, I think making, making those those clear educated decisions and looking at what is the alternative so you know you let's say we were to to ban cannabis and start you know not even allowing it in some states you're going to have people still using it the same thing goes with ingredients used in different cannabis products you ban them what are they replacing it with and is that indeed safer and you know what has been observed in many other industries you know i like to use bisphenol a or bpa as an example um, that has historically been used in plastics, a whole bunch of agencies started banning BPA. So what did, you know, industry do? They replaced it with compounds called BPS, BPF, which are oftentimes um, more toxic than BPA. So they replaced it with something worse. So I, I think that that, like, you know, nuanced perspective is oftentimes lost and it's just, let's ban it. Let's make it go away and everything's going to be better and we're all going to be safe. And it, you know, it, it's much more nuanced than that. And so like having that, that background is incredibly important. Um, so from business perspective, there's two reasons to have an echo or just a toxicologist in general, but I prefer an echo. Um, and that's because in the end, your product and the consumer using it will have a better experience because the things you don't want it, you know for certain are not there. And you're usually getting measurements of things that you do want to know about, the emitted dose of THC and what else is in there. You want to know what's going on. So if you put these, if you put this discipline in place, your consumers experience a better product. On the other side, and not to be cynical at all, but there's a lot of cover your butt going on here. Cannabis has never dealt with product liability or strict product liability yet. And eventually the day will come. And if you have um, an echo, you will be much better prepared for that day. Um, and if you also have an echo, you probably won't ever have that day come. So it's a two part system to make sure that your consumers are having a better experience and your company is having a better experience because you're not dealing with this sort of churn. So what happens when misinformation sort of leaks out about the products and, 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 and things get confused? Well, there aren't a lot of experts out there and, the, and media is really just great at studying quickly. And so they try to consume and learn everything they can about an industry in five days and then report on it. But cannabis is very complex. It's new, it's fractured. And so there's not a great source to understand what's going on. And what ends up happening in the media is they start to tell a story that to insiders doesn't make sense. And they equivocate legal, legal, and even sometimes products that have nothing to do with cannabis, but just have a similar uh, delivery method. 
and they put them all into one ball and they say, this stuff is bad. And the public, a, a well-meaning person that really doesn't know much about cannabis reads that story and goes, okay, it, it must be bad. So there's a, in the media, there's two stories about cannabis or three stories. It saves people's lives. It's this huge business thing. Also, it's scary. And so, it, you know, a good reporter is able to, to separate those lines and say, here's what's scary. And scary is just because you don't know about it yet. And after you know about it, you'll be less scared. Um, and the other parts you got to just deal with in, in, in your normal kind of reporting structure. So going off of that, it kind of working off the toxicology and, and the scientific method of cannabis, I'm just curious, I'm actually going to ask this one to you, Josh, and then Echo, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, is, you know, at least in the media, a lot of the talk is a schedule one drug. Now, if you hear people in the industry, it's remove the schedule one, allow it to be researched, allow it to actually be understood because of the potential saving lives, the cannabinoids, all that fun stuff. So from a scientific standpoint, if we can get it to the point where we can really start doing hard research, are we really that far behind? when it comes to hard research due to the federal de uh, regulation of it. Yeah, we're real behind. It's going to take years to catch up to give the scientific certainty that someone like Echo would need to sign off on, uh, you know, a big company selling these alternative or these, these minor cannabinoids. We know about THC. We know what it can do. We know a bit about CBD and we know what it can do. We know nothing about anything else. When I say nothing, nothing. And we have a lot of work to do. Uh, to understand, and it's not just about how the plant interacts. It go, it's from every aspect of the industry. We don't even know what the best spectrum to put on the plant is at the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, the end of the day. There's research to know and, and how those spectrums of light affect what cannabinoids you get. So it's not just the plant in the finished form and how it affects people. We don't know anything about really how to attenuate the grow to do things that we want it to do. So there's two huge areas that we need a lot more information. How can you grow cannabis the best way? And when I say the best way, meaning to, to hit the goals that you need. And then uh, what happens when you smoke cannabis and what, what are all those other things doing, really doing? And then what happens when you concentrate those things? So when you take something like CBN from 1% to 10%, what does that do? We've never had a plant with 10% CBN. Echo can't look at history to determine that CBN is good. We, and, and in that instance, we have nothing to tell us that. And what do we have to do? We have to design a bunch of experiments and then people a lot smarter than me have to figure out what it means. And then they have to tell people like me so we can do something with it. And so we're, we're I mean, I think we're five to eight years of good research behind where we need to be. I would say, honestly, even further behind than that. I mean, historically, um, scientific research on cannabis that was realistically funded had to kind of come out with the objective of showing a harmful effect. So the data that are out there are actually incredibly skewed. The other thing is that the data are out that are out there that were produced by academic institutions, and even if they're really well-run studies, the federal regulations required that you can only get cannabis from one source, the University of Mississippi. And that was, be essentially what we nowadays would refer to as ditch weed um, with it doesn't it doesn't resemble what is on the market in in really any state at all today whether you're just looking at the cannabis flower that people are smoking whether you're looking at at vape products dab products edibles etc and it hasn't been you know that stuff hasn't been used for years and our you know our researchers today till this day are still required if they're receiving federal funding to have to research that weed. And so to say that's somehow applicable to what people are actually using and seeing benefits from is, you know, probably not the case. And it's, it's really hard to see an effect. And then this research comes out and the media says, well, these data are equivocal and it's, it's harmful and it's this and that. Well, that's all that we've researched. So of course that's, that's what is, is found. And so, you know, when, when we start to look at, at some of these other minor cannabinoids and, you know, the, the other components of the plant, because different from like a pharmaceutical drug where, you know, you buy, you know, Lipitor 
it's Lipitor with a bunch of inactive, you know, a handful, one or two inactive ingredients to make it into pill form. And we've studied that, you know, in all these randomized controlled trials, and it's always very consistent within, you know, 3% concentration or whatever. Well, cannabis is a concoction of hundreds of substances that have interactions because they, they act on these very complex systems in the body. And so, you know, we probably need more research to, to get at, you know, positive and, and negative effects both on people than we do for a drug like Lipitor, which is a single substance that isn't interacting with a whole lot of other stuff in the actual stuff that you're taking. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that cannabis is risk-free, but I'm also not saying that it's, it doesn't have benefits. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced there are definitely some benefits for certain people in certain situations. And is it a whole lot more harmful than, than like alcohol? No. I mean, it provided you use it responsibly as you use alcohol. I mean, if you drink a, a barrel of wine, you're going to have some problems the same way. If you go decide to, you know, smoke a pound of weed, if you could even smoke it, you know, it, it could, it could cause some problems. <laughs> Interesting. It's hard to smoke a pound of weed. <laughs> what? It's hard to smoke a pound of weed in like a sitting. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be tough. So Josh, and, and, and again, Echo, you can follow up to it. My second part of the question, you had mentioned earlier, Delta 8. So again, I mentioned Delta 7. I don't know if that's a thing. I'm naive when it comes to some of these deltas. But I was just curious, with further research, do you feel that there's going to be separation or other things that come out of the plant due to opening up the scientific research um, of cannabis? Yeah, I think that I think that we're going to find more and more in there. And then we're going to understand what that does. And then we're going to want to concentrate that thing and bring it and bring it up to sort of to, to understand what it does in the marketplace. Um, there are other deltas out there. When you smoke cannabis, you experience delta nine. Like when you smoke THC, you experience delta nine. When you eat it, you experience delta 11. Uh, delta 10 is from a CBD elixir that then they 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 heat up and they they make this uh, substance called delta eight. It's sort of like a diet Coke, you know, to, to soda, or it's like a caffeine-free soda. Um, it's a step above CBD, but um, it's not THC. People get an effect. Um, so I think that as people drill down into the plant, they're going to find more things that if they isolate and concentrate will deliver a piece of the effect. As Echo mentioned, it's a bunch of chemicals mixed together. And so, and they have interactions with each other. And so, you know, they're going to find one or two things and it's going to be the, the new hot thing. And it's not going to be regulated and um, it's going to get into the marketplace and it's going to cause some confusion. It's going to hurt regulated marketplaces. So the best thing to do is start a research to understand what's in there, what understand what happens when you concentrate these things so that we can get, if something's safe, let's let it roll. If it's not safe, let's stop it. And that's good for both consumers and industry. Real quick. Uh, I am a newbie when it comes to cannabis and marijuana. What does Delta eight Delta 10, what, what does all that the Delta signify? It has, to do with the, it has to do with the chemical structure and where certain bonds occur on a, on a ring structure and they're numbered. And so that's where the Delta eight, Delta nine comes in. Okay. Thank you. In other words, Nathaniel needs to go back to school to get that question fully answered and understand it. Go take a chemistry class. <laughs> I think that Dan can bite me since he was apparently much poorer at chemistry than I was. It was my worst subject. There was no question about it. I was definitely better than you. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so my question was, it sounds like there's a fear of, I don't even know. Is, is there a fear with the, the research experiments that people within your field, Echo, would have to conduct that the federal officials or, I, I don't even know, are they afraid of what these experiments would consist of in comparison, say, to uh, the, the studies that were done with Lipitor or, and these other FDA approved drugs? This is opening up a whole can of worms. Um, I don't know if afraid is the word. I would say historically there's been a lot of politics around cannabis and it was used as a weapon to target certain groups of people 
Um, and, you know, I mean, you can, you can go back to the days of like reefer madness and, you know, racial undertones and, you know, racial injustice um, that, that go back to this. And, and that was really, you know, federally sponsored. Um, so I, I don't know if it's the fear that we're going to find something good um, or not. The other thing is, is nowadays, I think you probably have, you know, some, some lobbying ex, ex, lobbying efforts for industries that are concerned about the cannabis industry taking away some of their business. I mean, there's some thoughts that big alcohol could be, you know, lose a significant, you know, a, a significant amount of money because people will stop drinking alcohol and start using cannabis. I think there's probably some, some fear in the tobacco industry as well. Um, you know, and then you have the people who have, have, have listened to the media and to the reefer madness and to all of that sort of stuff where you've got the moms that, oh my gosh, if my kid, if my kid uses some weed, they're gonna, you know, all hell is gonna break loose and it's it's gonna be a huge problem. And so I think it's probably a mixture of factors, you know, that that some of the rules and restrictions associated with cannabis have have kind of stayed in place, even if they weren't justified in the beginning. <laughs> I, I think Yoda might say, if Yoda had to put this, he might say something like, in this one, the politics are strong, they are. And <laughs> and I think that makes me think of manipulation. I might just set Echo off here. She might hulk out because we've talked about this before. Um, so I guess that's a warning to everybody, <laughs> including Echo. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a soapbox. You you mentioned it already in part of the question, but, but there's more there that I think people should know. Um, Federal funding, we've talked about this before, highly manipulated. There are things that, that are sought after and things that get said and things that get spun. Can you dig a little bit deeper to give the audience an idea as to what, what does that look like to receive funding? What has to happen? You know, is that something you could speak on? Yeah, from a, a very high level, you probably don't want me to go into great depths that and I've never had a desire to be an academic researcher who has to apply for, for grant funding. But essentially what a, a professor at a university will do, um, they will come up with a research idea and they submit a grant to the federal government, um, usually something like the National Institutes of Health. Um, and they will say, here's my idea for some experiments. This is why we need to do it. Um, this is what it's going to show. Here's how it brings value to, you know, our, I don't know, improves the greater good or something along those lines. It, it advances scientific research and here's why you should fund it. And then that is reviewed by a panel of experts according to um, guidelines provided by um, the National Institutes of Health or, or whatever federal organization they apply to, and then they decide to fund the, the studies or not. And then they have three to five years to conduct those studies, publish the results, um, if they hope to, to get um, additional funding in the future. And then the other thing is there's also academic institutions that they work for that are also um, reviewing these grants and these experiments and saying these are okay to run under our university or not. And so with those kind of two levels of review and restrictions, it leads to, to that bias that we've talked about, because, and especially with cannabis, that is a schedule, considered a schedule one drug and that there's no, there's no medical use to it. Why should you even be studying it? We already know it's bad. But if you want to show that it's even worse than we knew before, we'll probably fund that. Um, I mean, and that's, that's really unfortunate, but that's, that's, essentially what's happened. I think it's opening up a bit. I mean, it's only within the last few months that um, I believe the DEA, FDA have started to allow different sources of cannabis that can be studied besides that University of Mississippi, Mississippi ditchweed, I'll call it, um, that's available for researchers today because there's lots of restrictions even if they get those grants studied or grants funded there are lots of restrictions as to what cannabis they can actually study. They cannot go buy it in California. A researcher cannot go buy a cannabis from a dispensary, ask a person to use it and do any sort of research on that individual, even if it's like asking them some questions on a survey. So crazy. 
It's crazy. Yeah. Gotta love those restrictions. Go yeah. figure. <laughs> this is part one of Cannabis, the plant that keeps giving. Next week, in part two of the episode, we are going to discuss the major hurdles this industry is facing and how the companies are growing vertically like the alcohol industry after prohibition. Josh and Echo will also talk about what the future is like for cannabis. Stay tuned. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time, 